I totally didn't lose the intro and outro for this week's video. So, hey guys, we are back for episode 4 of Berserk 2013. This episode is called Epiphany. It is a setup episode, this one. It's to put all the pieces in place and uh, get your characters into the positions they need to be so you know what's going to happen, who the antagonists are going to be, what the goal of the hero is meant to be, and all that jazz. So it's not the most exciting episode, but uh, it's a necessary one. It does some things as usual, which make me consider why. Why is this animation company doing it? Why isn't it given to a better company? And also, what's going on? Why were these choices made? Who can say? I'm not going to do much of a non-spoiler talk at the beginning here, because, well, I can't be bothered. I just want to get into the meat and bones of this episode. So, we're going to have that bailet scream, because that's what Andy likes. So, go ahead. And just to set the scene of where this episode starts off, it starts off with Guts having a dream, or an epiphany, but it's it's actually a premonition, so maybe it should have been called premonition. Anyway, it's about Casca being burnt at the stake, and it's been shown to him by this little baby demon thingy. I'm pretty sure this is the first time it's been referenced in the show? In this show it is, definitely, but I'm not sure if it's been referenced in any of the other shows, but it has popped up a few other times in the manga unsurprisingly. So he decides to go and check on Casca by going all the way back to the blacksmith who got him his hand, got him his sword, uh, his name is Godo and it's where he left a uh, young little Rickett after the eclipse. When he gets there uh, we find out it's been two years effectively since the eclipse happened and uh, for those that don't know that would have been the Black Swordsman arc and I'm still not too fussed that it's not included the Black Swordsman arc is just, it's okay. It's like a season one. You don't have to watch it to get into it, and it, it, it it's somewhat important, but not really important. Actually, if you like to talk about the things that aren't very important, the very first chapter of Berserk is completely out of character for Guts. Why? Because he's porking a demon. Not just a demon, but an apostle. And then he kills it. And knowing Guts, as you learn about Guts uh, over the manga and how he's been uh, sexually abused and whatnot, you think... I don't think Guts would have had sex with a demon, even to kill it. I think he probably just would have chopped a head off before turning into an apostle. But never mind. You know, it was it was finding its feet, and it's a interesting way to start off a manga, I suppose. We find out that Casca isn't there anymore. She's uh, pissed off, basically. And she was kept in a mine, and that's why she was kind of let out, and she ran away. No explanation of why she was kept in a mine. Uh, we know if you've read the manga, maybe it was in the movie as well, the very last movie. I, I honestly can't remember. The reason they're kept in this mine is because they're branded. Spirits are attracted to them. We know this, but if they're in the mine, there's some magical properties about it which are able to keep away uh, most evil spirits. Not apostles. Apostles can still find them, like the swine demon, uh, but generally they are safer there than you know, just out in the real world. And Casca, I think, has a bit more of a natural skin tone to her, the colour that she should be in the show. I don't know whether the, the the people who animate the show don't know how to do lighting on her without just whitewashing her, or if it's a filter's fault that she's been whitewashed, but in a few scenes at the very least in this episode, you're like, yeah, Casca's looking normal again, finally. Good. Good. Let's hopefully keep that a bit more consistent as we go. Because I know a lot of people are having issues with it, and I am as well. Don't worry about it. So Guts is having a conversation with Godo, who is in his bed because he's old, and he's not doing too well. He's coming to the end of his life. Uh, and this is the point where it really annoyed me. It annoyed me more than the last episode. And why? Because it it makes a lot more of that episode superfluous, you know, pointless. And what do I mean by that? Well, we have a flashback, and Godo says that, you know, he took Casca in, he took Guts in, and he took Rick in after the eclipse. They were uh, buggered up, and a demon came. Now, as I mentioned in the last episode, that was the swine demon. In this one, we'll start off with this because it's annoying, it's some kind of weird, really badly designed chicken demon. That looks terrible. It looks awful. And the fact it's not the swine demon is so strange. Like, why did we have the swine demon used in the last episode as the Keeper of the Hounds, which seemed to add nothing, because it didn't, and we didn't use him here. I could have assumed... I, I, don't, I didn't need to see Guts fighting it. I didn't need to see him killing it. That's fine. I don't mind that. But the fact that you, you took the, the monster out, 
you put him here, you gave him a pointless backstory in the last episode, and then you just shoved in a random poorly designed creature for here, is very annoying. I don't see the point in it. What a waste of time. Makes even more of that, that entire mansion scene irrelevant. And you should have just not bothered with it. Also, while Guts is talking to Godo, Godo is never CG in this show. In this episode, he is always a 2D character, and he is talking with Guts, who is a 3D character. Very off-putting, because they are both human characters, so why are they so different? There's no reason for it. As I said, I think, in like maybe episode 1, if you wanted to do the fact that fae creatures and demons are the CG characters and maybe his sword as well, that's fine, and keep all the humans 2D. I'd be alright with that, because you're showing uh, a more of a visual distinction between humans and monsters, and maybe that's the artistic style you want to go with, and that's fine. But to do it between human and human for no reason apart from, ah, it's too expensive, or all we need to make it cheaper, is, at least to me, very, very annoying. So the next bit I want to talk about is Guts is in the mine now, uh, and he's reminiscing about, you know, stuff that's happened in Casca and how he's fit in with the world and how stuff's not really changed for him too much. And then we have the first uh, showing of his inner darkness, his inner beast. Now, my problem with this is I don't like the fact, personally, that the mouth moves and you hear the, the voice because it's meant to be an internal thing anyway, and it just looks weird, it moving a mouth and words coming out of it. It's like Mr. Ed. You can see the horse's mouth move, but it doesn't look quite right that human words are coming out of it. You could say this is Andy, this is being cheap, but if you just wanted to have the head there without it moving and the words coming out and maybe it making facial expressions, I, I think that looks better generally. Also, I didn't like how the voice sounded. It didn't sound very demonic. It was a very a slightly deeper but still very human sounding voice. And again, this is an internal uh, evil and it is evil within Guts. So it should be a much more uh, foreboding sound to it. I think, anyway. Like some kind of reverb on it to make it a bit more echoey and a bit more depth to it, or something like that. This is just, uh, it's just, it'd just be like me doing the voice of a demon. Hello, I'm Andy, I'm a demon. Ah, I'm, I'm inside you, and I'm gonna get you. Cover yourself in blood. You love it. It just doesn't work. There's not a lot that happens at the blacksmiths, it's just kind of catching up on a little bit of what's happened in Guts past and reforging his armor and then setting him off. On, it's it's to set him up on his next journey, on the next story arc, which is the Conviction arc, which I've talked about before. So we jump along to the Iron Holy Chain Knights of the Knights of the Hi Holy Iron Chain Order. Those guys. We're back with them in Farness and Azan and Seprico. And between Azan and Seprico, we have exposition time, where they explain that, uh, that the Curishin, those people have taken the capital of Midland, which we saw, which was really badly done in the last episode. Uh, they mentioned that there's a plague going on. Again, an offhand line. Maybe it would have been a better idea to show those bodies that I mentioned last time and then have a plague lying with it to knit it all together. Never mind. Never mind. What do I know? Yeah, and they basically set the scene of what's going on at the moment and why they're going to the uh, Conviction Tower and having basically a witch hunt because apparently at this site, this holy ground area, uh, apparently a lot of heretics are bobbing about so they are sending a Grand Inquisitor or a, a normal Inquisitor, one of the two. And the Inquisitor in question is called Mosgus. I'm 80% sure that that's not how you pronounce but that's how it's spelled, Moz Gus. Uh, maybe his name was just Gus and he didn't think it was fancy a name enough, so he decided to vote Moz at the start of it. The carriage that he's been escorted in is attacked by people who haven't been too happy that he's been, you know, burning their families and whatnot. Who would be? Not me. And we have the introduction of his torturers, his buddies basically, and the antagonists for the, the arc are coming up and... FYI people for guts to fight. <laughs> You'll see. Now we have a point where a person who's been captured uh, talks about divine punishment and it angers, angers our inquisitor friend and we have a really bad uh, 2D animation bit or 3D animation bit, I can't remember which, and it doesn't look as good as it does in the manga so here's a picture of how it looked in the anime and here's one from the manga. You decide yourself <laughs> which you think looks better. So they decide to punish the people who attacked his carriage because well, they lost, so they gotta get some punishment. And 
they get put on the bro the breaking wheel or something like that, which is again a Dark Souls reference. And when the people are being uh, well broken to be put on the wheels, the crowd look they're meant to look horrified, but they look a little bit happy. Especially this one guy. He looks real pleased about this whole situation. So as you can tell, this is recorded on a different day, but I kind of lost the footage for uh, the end of the video. So here we go. Uh, my final thoughts on this episode are it's it's doing stuff story-wise, which is very important, and setting up all the pieces, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but once again, they've mixed up stuff which I don't agree with. The animation is as it always is, and it's just mediocre. Anyway, guys, I hope this has been somewhat entertaining and all that jazz, and I will catch you next week for uh, episode 5. So, catch you later, guys. Kukunk!